Today's scripture is from uh, New Testament, Thessalonians first chapter first uh, verse two to seven. First Thessalonians chapter one verse two to seven. As I read through the passage, I hope that all of us can hear the voice of living God. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in all our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with the words, but with also power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. We know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of the severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Amen. The other day I was watching a Catholic priestly ordination ceremony on the Catholic broadcasting station. Um, that is like the appointment of the pastor's uh, ordination um, ceremony for the Protestant um, church. So as someone who studied the liturgy, I watched the ceremony with some envy because it was so magnificent and it was really solemn and it was really great and impressive ceremony. Um, the highlight of the Catholic ordination ceremony is when the priest um, bend on down their knees. So, like all the candidates of this whole Catholic um, priest, uh, bend down on the knees, and um, they have these white clothes at the foot of the altar. So, in a huge, like church and a temple. They have this solemn and holy um, ceremony, and it was really impressive. And the uh, one thing that was really um, impressive was the whole lengthy prayer that was offered after they bent down on their knees. It was really lengthy. Um, it started by uh, asking for blessings from the God the Father and to intercede for the priestly candidates. And then the second part is to ask for the blessing of the Jesus, the Son. And then you also continue to pray to ask for the blessings from the Holy Spirit. And so the prayer goes on and on. And then they also pray for God the Trinity to grant the blessings for the priest. Well, so far, it was uh, okay and it was acceptable. But what comes after really made me to realize this big difference uh, between the Catholic and the Protestantism because they pray to the Virgin Mary to give the blessings. And then they also pray to St. Michael and the other apostles to ask for their blessings. And then they also called the names of the angels and the saints and the apostles like the John, Paul, and Peter, one by one, and uh, they also asked for their blessings. And then they also call out the names of the Saint Nicholas, Saint Antonius, and the others um, as, I mean, it was a bit, um, boring, but they kept saying the names to ask for their blessings. And as I listened to this prayer, I mean, by that time of the prayer, I really saw the huge difference between the Catholic and the Protestantism, um, the whole churches. Isn't it enough to pray to God as the Trinity of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? I mean, that's what we would think. Why do they really have to call all the names, um, asking for these whole blessings, calling all those names for the lengthy player? Well, 
the intention may be to demonstrate that the office of priest is really connected to many apostles, angels, and saints. It occurred to me that these prayers may inadvertently give all the glory to other saints, apostles, and the Virgin Mary rather than to only God. Today is the Reformation Sunday. It is the time to celebrate the reformations uh, from the corruption of the medieval churches and to examine the path of the right path of faith. And it is Sunday that we have to ask ourselves whether we have our faith in the right place. But as we celebrate this 506th anniversary this year, it, we have to admit that we um, are afraid uh, and we are doubtful whether we really do have the right faith. And some people even criticize the Protestant churches today for not having the right faith. So, well, these are the questions that we have to ask and um, we have some fear and we feel sad about uh, who we are today. And even some say that the Korean churches are no different from uh, the medieval churches in the past. Are we having the right faith? If there is something that we have to correct, what are they to make sure that we get right? For you as a person or for, I mean, as a church, what should we do? Many people think of the Middle Ages as a dark age a time of decadence. But from a scholar's perspective um, who is studying the worship, I think the Middle Ages were in some ways a time of growth and advances and development rather than a dark age, although some would like to call it as the dark age. In terms of the development of worship service in particular, the Middle Ages is where the order of worship became most elaborate and varied. And this is because the order and the contents of most Catholic masses were finalized and completed during the Middle Ages. There are a few times like the Middle Ages when there were so many different pastoral uh, programs. For example, there were daily private masses in the churches or the cathedrals, and there were masses for sick people in the family, masses for business or the commerce, or masses to find someone to marry, and so on. And these masses gradually became more advanced with so called masses to. Uh, elevate the torment of the soul that were set in advance to reduce the suffering of the soul when someone died. So, I mean, you may not believe this, but there were masses to catch thieves and to find stolen goods back. So these were like a whole lot of masses that they had. The medieval churches also had many programs to help its followers to maintain a deep spirituality. They encouraged prayers every morning, midday prayers, and evening prayers. And they were there were programs like the pilgrimage to the Holy Land. All these things were recommended for the believers. There were programs for penance. There were offerings like the indulgences. Numerous monasteries were built, and there were many monks who lived in them and led them. And they built great churches um, during this Middle Ages. The St. Peter's, Northam, and other large and the famous and well-known chapels that you may see when you travel to European countries, most, uh, most of them were built during this Middle Age. So churches were really uh, boasting their power. By appearance, these uh, Middle Ages were really uh, grandiose, and um, they had a lot of uh, strong and uh, powerful, like the churches and the programs. There were so many events where the 
church members could, could attend. And whenever they saw these grand churches, they might have felt pious. The more pious members probably attended more masses, participated in penance, dedicated themselves to building temples and churches, and also bought indulgences. The reformer Luther was also born into this medieval church, and he tried to defend his faith through the penance and practice as he was taught by the medieval church of his day. And you know the famous story of Luther, although there are so many others. And by 1510, he visited Rome. And there uh, he visited the Lateran Basilica, where he crawled on his hands and kneed up the 28 steps of the Pilate's staircase, also known as the Scholar Sancta. Because the medieval church taught that the climbing the steps, which were said to be the steps Christ ascended before Pilate, while reciting the Lord's Prayer, would lessen one's punishment in purgatory. That's what people believed. So Luther climbed all 28 steps, kissing one by one. Um, so he tried that, as was told by other people, as a way to lessen his punishment. But he could not feel any peace in his heart. And then he muttered, what good is this? That is um, his famous saying. So this whole period of splendor is often re referred to by later generations as dark age. So why was the case? I mean, they have grand buildings and churches and great programs, but why people call them as dark age or time of decadence? And um, there's um, one reason why it is the case. At least for the reform reformists, they saw, um, for reformers, they saw despair and the perversion of faith rather than hope. So what is the problem? What is distortion here? Later, historians summarized the problem this way. The problem with the medieval, medieval churches was the only one. They did not address the spiritual anxieties of the people of their day with the gospel. Rather than addressing the spiritual insecurities of the people who were having different programs, the medieval churches continued to confuse them with one program after another and make them feel compared to do something more for salvation. They provided so many programs at the church, but it didn't really um, address these spiritual insecurities. Rather, churches um, told them to do more. And in this way, the medieval churches could boast of its massive appearance and the scale, but the members, the congregation, were driven away from spiritual confidence and forced to lead a tired and unsure religious life. The conviction about salvation and true liberation and true freedom could not be found at churches. People could not have this true liberation. Um, so the Middle Ages were a time of many different faiths, but they lacked a true sense of liberation. On the other hand, the early churches were totally different. They were filled with confidence. The members of the early churches um, didn't have or they could not afford a large churches. And they could not have like a really uh, elaborated uh, worship service, but they had one thing, which is about the confidence and the belief uh, about their salvation. They fled persecution and they gathered to worship in an underground tomb called catacombs. And they shouted and they rejoiced that Jesus had indeed risen. So they. Um, had this whole conviction about their belief, and that was the early church members. 
for them, death was no longer a fear. Persecution and suffering was a glorious opportunity to join the ranks of the martyrdom. That didn't mean anything for them. And poverty or any suffering didn't mean anything for them. They had true liberation. Many people today look at the churches, and especially the Protestant church and the Korean churches, and they say it, it's like the Middle Age churches. Well, perhaps um, they say that for different reasons, but at least I think the criticism seems to be valid given what's going on in our church life. You know, we have early morning prayers, we have revival meetings and conferences, we have many weekly services and devotions, pilgrimages and the missionary visits and trips and anointing meetings at various prayer centers. And in the past, even a bottle of water was sold at prayer centers that was good to um, drink. But they are not really making liberated, they are making thirstier. Well, if they are making us thirstier, then we are not on the right track. We feel we are not complete and we are not getting there. We feel that we are falling short. And although we do the volunteer work for the church and although we do the survey worship service every week, but if you don't feel the full liberation, then your face is not on the right track. So what is the problem here? Today's text is the opening verse of Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. Paul is lavishing praise on the churches in Thessalonica, encouraging them in their endeavors and thanking God for them. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. That's what the police uh, saying for the church in Thessalonica. How they became such a praised and exemplary church? Was it because of like a long hours of training and education or because of a good programs or good teachers or good churches or great buildings? Do you think that is why they became so praised and as a good church? Well, we don't know all the details of this Thessalonian church, but based on the book of Acts, Paul didn't stay long in the area and didn't do much ministry for uh, the church. As you may recall, the church in Thessalonica was a part of Paul's second evangelistic church. He traveled from Philippi to Thessalonica and from there to Berea and then to Athens. The story of this visit to Thessalonica is told and described in the Acts um, chapter 17. So what happened in Thessalonica? Paul was only stayed there for like three weeks. And then persecution happened, and the Jews caught them and locked them up. And eventually, they got out of Thessalonica because Jameson got out on bail, and that was it. And then a little later, we heard a beautiful words about the church. The word about the church and Thessalonica had spread so fast through the whole region. So how did this happen and how they have become such a great church and a great model for the other believers? Paul the Apostle says this about the gospel he preached to them. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. 
So Paul the Apostle is saying that the church in Thessalonica is growing in the power of the gospel and with the great confidence given by the Holy Spirit. And the Paul just taught them the um, gospel and with the confidence and with the power um, of the Holy Spirit, it really worked on them. I mean, it was not by the deeds of people, but it really worked out by God uh, open these Gospels um, shared by the Paul. So um, in this letter uh, of Paul, we see how great and powerful the Gospel is. It is the Gospel that saves us. It is the Gospel that sets us free. It is the Gospel that gives us the truth through freedom. And it is the Gospel that leads us to eternal hope. I want every member of our church gathered here and every member who is joining us from the online or virtually or whatever uh, to feel the power of this gospel. I want you to experience the true freedom and liberation through the gospel. Of course, uh, coming to church in person is important and also the programs of the church and events are important and having great worship service, of course it matters, it's important, but all the things should not be a tool to oppress us. It should be a tool and means to set us free. And Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That is really a meaningful and valuable word because it tells us about what the truth is. Truth is something that sets us free. So it means truth should save us and liberate us. It will give us the life, and that is the true truth. Something that binds us and immobilizes us will not be the truth. Something that keeps us in fear is not the truth. It should be something that sets us free and saves us and liberates us. So what is the message that we have to get from here? The truth shall make you free. What is the important message that we have to take from here? It means that we are tied to something. We are bound to something. So what is that? You may know what it is in your life, in your personal life. We are all tied to something. We are bound to something, enslaved to something. It could be worries, concerns about your children and about the future, uncertainty, or some power or money. It could be anything and we are bound to these things. We are worried about getting sick, we are worried about getting poor, and we are afraid of um, these things. And uh, we have to set ourselves free from those things, and that's what truth comes in. So what are you bound to? What are you slaved to? So. The common thing about this thing is death. It all goes back to or boils down to death. We are afraid of getting sick. We are afraid of getting poor because we are ultimately afraid of dying. We are afraid of poverty because we don't want to die because of the poverty. So death is the ultimate, like the cause of all these things that are not free. So that is the root cause that's really preventing us from being free. The Bible teaches that the death comes from the human scene, which separates us from God. So we have to overcome this, this connection, and that is why Jesus came to the earth. He died on the cross for humans and he reconnected us with God. We are slaved to um, death. We were the slaved to uh, death. 
and by meditation, by practice, and um, by anything, we cannot overcome them on our own. It's only Jesus Christ who can really overcome this disconnect and who can really break um, this whole chains of the not being free. Therefore, only Jesus Christ, we can have the true freedom and liberation. And Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. For the law of the Holy Spirit or the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. The true liberation can be only found in Jesus Christ. And uh, we have to accept that that's what God has done for us, and that is the belief. And the faith will save us and liberate us. The Holy Spirit will work on us, and He will give us the confidence and conviction. And that is the faith, and that is the power of the gospel. Um, let me share with you some sad story. Because um, I want you to pray for me. Last week, um, we had some sad occasion. My beloved mother-in-law passed away, and um, now she's in the heaven. Well, she said, do not share the news and with others, and do not have any funeral, and do not and invite any guests to the funeral, and I couldn't really share that with you. I'm sorry. Um, because she didn't want to the share the sadness, and um, she said that she just want to feel happy going back to the heaven, her home. So um, when she um, passed away on the last night, when she was in short breath, I was at her bedside, and we prayed, and um, um, we shared some words of or love, and I prayed. And um, and then um, she had a short breath, and um, she was in pain, but she still had a very bright and happy face, like a runner who was getting to the finish line to win the whole race. So that was what I saw and what we saw in her face. And the uh, next day, um, morning, um, we read the Bible. I had a good battle on this land, and I finished my race. And I now know that I'm going back to my God. And that was the Bible verses that we read in the morning prayer. I think that is the power of gospel. Um, we face the death, but we don't feel any fear. And that's what gospel can work on us. We don't have any fear of the death. It's not about what will come after the life, but it's really happening every day in our life, even in the frustrations, in the sickness, and in the failures, in all the pains and sufferings that we have. It doesn't matter because we have this whole belief in Jesus Christ who saved us. And um, God or Jesus has risen indeed. And that is the truth. And everything, all the worries and concerns and sins, they are gone away because Jesus died on the cross for us. That is the power of gospel. Uh, they are my beloved NAM members. I wanted to regain this faith. And that's the true reformation of the faith and churches. And only then we can be on the right track with our faith. Let me share with you the confession of Paul. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from face to face. As it is written, the righteousness will uh, shall live by faith. Let's pray. Dear God of love, we confess that gospel is your power to set us free and make us alive and to give us true liberation. 
have pity on us who are always caught up in the trivial things, whose minds are all set on the things that are not matter, that didn't matter. Help us to see again that we do not earn our salvation by our works, that we do not come to you by our own merits. Help us to see the faith and saving. Uh, you saved us with the grace so that we may live in true freedom and in, in your uh, liberation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.